Moving into Isaiah chapter 5. Chapter 5 concludes this opening prophecy that we've seen in these four chapters, uh, starting in chapter 2. Uh, we saw in chapter 1, we saw this indictment that the Lord issued against Israel because of Israel's rebellion against God. And we've seen God's judgment of Israel detailed in the following chapters. And we've also seen at the beginning of chapter 2 and then at the end of chapter 4, uh, the promise of the restoration of Israel and the Davidic throne. And also at the end of chapter 4, not only the restoration of Israel, but the promise of a redeemer. So we've seen that the glory of Israel is going to, at some future time, be restored and even probably moved beyond what it was, the glory it had seen under Kings David and Solomon. And then the Redeemer who would come and cleanse Israel of its sins and bring about this age. And Isaiah punctuates this now as we move into chapter 5. Verse 1, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice and saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. There's an ongoing debate about whether these opening verses in chapter 5 among biblical scholars constitute a parable or an allegory. I sometimes think biblical scholars debate one another so they can demonstrate their scholarliness. Is that a word? No, it should be. It should be. Well, I was wondering, what is the difference between a parable and an allegory? So I looked it up, and here is the difference. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. Parable. An allegory is a story that can be interpreted to show a moral or spiritual lesson. So you see the vast difference between them. So I'm thinking, why don't we just call this an allegorical parable? Anyway, it begins with Isaiah himself speaking, or more likely actually singing this, uh, as, as, a, as a psalmist would sing a psalm. He begins, I will sing for the one I loved a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. So the one for whom Isaiah is singing is, of course, the Lord God. That's who his beloved is, or his loved one. The vineyard, the Lord's vineyard, as we see in verse 7, is Israel. Isaiah's loved one, God, had a vineyard planted on a fertile hillside. In other words, what Isaiah is saying as he begins this psalm is that Israel, the people, were planted in a land, a fertile land, a productive land, a land that was flowing with milk and honey, which is what God had promised Moses way back in Exodus. Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, 
and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, and a whole bunch of otherites. So God has planted Israel on this fertile hillside, this, his vineyard Israel on this fertile hillside, where he clearly expected them to grow and prosper. Verse 2 uh, he, again referring to Isaiah's beloved, the Lord God, he dug it, the land, he dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. So Isaiah is comparing what the Lord has done to the work that would be done by a farmer or in this case a, a, a vineyard keeper, a vine, uh, a vine master in preparing a field to be a productive, arable piece of land, clearing the rocks out of the field, turning the soil over so that the soil has a chance to aerate and that the soil has a chance to become well watered and so that it basically become fertile. And then, of course, planting, as it says, the choicest vines, not just cheap vines, but the choicest vines, the best vines that could be found. And then building a watchtower, and this was common back in ancient Israel. They would build a watchtower in or near a field, and basically there would be a watchman who would spend his time in there, typically during the night, but over the course of the growing season to make sure that the vines were tended, to make sure that they were nurtured, uh, that they were fertilized as needed, and also to keep any predators or poachers from coming in and either ruining the crop, eating the crop, or stealing the grapes. So he builds the watchtower, and then he also builds a wine press so that when harvest season comes, the grapes that are harvested, they can harvest the juice from the grapes and then take the juice and ferment it into wine. Verse 2 continues, Then he looked for a crop, of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So the result of all of the Lord's work was that the land failed to produce as God had intended it. Verse 3 begins, and we, we see now the Lord is beginning to speak himself. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? The first two verses here, one and two, Isaiah gives a brilliant summation of the history of Israel. From the time of Abraham through to this present time, through the reigns of these four kings that he mentions back at the beginning of verse of chapter 1. And we see that the promise of the land flowing with milk and honey, the promise of bringing Israel into this land, planting them there, and expecting them to produce fruits of righteousness and holiness and justice and so forth. And then here in verses 3 and 4, God now speaks through the prophet. And he rhetorically asks the dwellers in Jerusalem and the people of Israel, the people of Judah, to judge themselves. What more could I have done than what I've done to make this land productive? Why, when the Lord looked for a good crop, did the children of Israel only produce unrighteousness, disobedience, and the desire to seek after false God rather than the righteousness and holiness and devotion to their Lord God that he expected. And of course, the result, verse 5, now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither 
pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. In these two verses, God promises the removal of his hand of providence and protection from his people, Israel. What is left is exile. Those who are remaining from, and I, as I said, I, I believe we have seen the northern kingdom either in the process or already having been taken off into captivity by the Assyrians. And of course, we have the coming captivity that we know will happen in about two generations, maybe three generations, when Babylon comes in and carries what's left of the children of Israel living in Judah, and they're carried off to Babylon. And if there's any doubt what the prophet is getting at here, verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Over the years, I've heard several Christian leaders say that if God doesn't judge, and they pick some city, sometimes it's Las Vegas, sometimes it's San Francisco, some place where the level of moral turpitude has reached a degree that they find offensive and appalling and so forth. So if God doesn't judge San Francisco, he will owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, of course, the problem, the far more relevant thought, is to take a closer look at God's church. Those who claim to represent Christ in these last days and consider that if God doesn't soon judge his church, he's going to owe the children of Israel an apology. I mean, how many churches do we see not just here in the United States, but around the world, where God has become almost an afterthought, where social justice has become the focus of their gospel message, where we're even seeing some churches here in the United States that have been strong denominational Christian churches actually begin to embrace the worship of the mother goddess Gaia, I shudder to think what will happen when, and I mean when, not if, because I, I see this coming. But I shudder to think what will happen when God removes his hand of providence and protection from the United States. God pronounces six woes on Israel, the children of Israel, in the closing portion of chapter 5. And what I find chilling is how closely some of these woes and some of the things God describes here currently parallel what's taking place here in the United States today. But we can only hope that similar judgments that God details against Israel do not come against us. Keep in mind also that calamities that follow a turning away from God often are little more than the natural consequences of poor decisions. I've said for years, if you remove God from your culture and from your society, what you end up with is a godless culture and a godless society. Verse 8, Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. Under the law of Moses, it was allowable for a family to sell its family lands to another landowner, maybe a, one who was doing better, wealthier. But all such sales. I mean, it was even possible to sell yourself or sell your son or daughter into 
what amounted to indentured servitude, but they called slavery. But what happened is that in the year of Jubilee, which was what, every 50 years, in the year of Jubilee, the land was to be returned to the original owners. Those who had been sold or sold themselves into slavery were to be freed. And that was what the law of Moses declared. None of these transactions were to be permanent. But what has happened by this point in Israel's history is that the wealthy landowners were acquiring more and more property, fields, houses, and they were keeping it permanently. They weren't returning it. Uh, there's some speculation that the reason for the length of the Babylonian captivity was to parallel or to respond to Israel's lack of having observed the Jubilee year for however many generations. So instead of having every 50 years or a, every Sabbath year, which was every seventh year, that God said, okay, I'm just going to lump them all together and we're going to let the land rest for the time you haven't let it rest. In verse 9, the Lord is declaring, in verse 9, the Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate and find mansions left without occupants. What the Lord is declaring is that since they have not observed their Sabbath years and their Jubilee years, he's going to force them to do it. The fine mansions left without occupants. The exile of the children of Israel in the northern kingdom and then the coming exile of the children of Israel who were remaining in the southern kingdom. A 10-acre vineyard, verse 10, a 10-acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine. A homer of seed will yield only an ephah of grain. In other words, famine. A 10-acre vineyard should produce many gallons of wine or grape juice per acre. A 10-acre vineyard, God is saying here, is only going to yield a bath, which is about six gallons of wine. A homer of seed was about six bushels. It should yield about 60 bushels of grain. It should be about 10 bushels per bushel of grain sown. The yield would be only an ephah of grain. It's about two pecks or half a bushel. Instead of 60 bushels of grain, only a half bushel would be the yield. And we know extremes in weather, flooding and drought, with the loss of crops that follow, will result in famine. And we're seeing that today. Of course, a lot of people are liking to link these extremes in weather to man-made climate change. And of course, my observation is when in Earth's history has the climate not changed? The question I have is how much of it is man-made and how much of it is just the natural course of the Earth being the Earth? But are we seeing in these extremes of weather and the droughts and the flooding and so forth that are following after this and the famines that are taking place around the world? Is this the result of man-made climate change? Or are we seeing what Jesus described in the Olivet Discourse as the beginning of birth pains that will precede his return? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Is that what we're seeing? I'll leave it up to you. Isaiah continues, Woe to those who rise early in the morning and run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. God is describing here 
those of his children who have abandoned the things of God and have sought after worldly pleasures. There's nothing wrong with having an occasional, shall we call it, an adult beverage. Nothing wrong with having an occasional glass of wine. It's when the pursuit of strong drink and drunken revelries become the focus of your life that there's a problem. And that's what God is talking about here. Nothing wrong with listening to music, though at times there may be some difficulty in trying to determine what music is, trying to distinguish between music and what I like to call rhythmic noise. But again, when partying and clubbing become the focus of your life, when you're abandoning the things of God to pursue these worldly pleasures, that's when there is an issue. Verse 13, therefore my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore death expands its jaw, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles and masses with all their brawlers and revelers. So the people will be brought low and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. What God is saying to Israel, and I believe what God is saying to us today, is that if all you care about is the pursuit of worldly gain and worldly pleasures, you will be humbled. I mentioned earlier, you know, look what has happened this last week with this college admission scandal. A lot of these folks, both the, the rich and powerful elites and some of the men and women that they hired and bribed are seeing their lives, their careers, and their families being devastated because they thought they could cheat the system and get away with it. You know, coaches at these colleges have been fired disgraced the some of these parents uh, you know a couple of a-list actresses will probably have difficulty finding work again uh, they've had their shows up the, what uh, the Laughlin woman Lori Laughlin she's on Hallmark a lot she is she's been fired by yeah, Hallmark she was. Did they take all her movies off too? I don't know if they've done that or not there but there probably won't be you know, so any residuals she'd be getting will be gone is it worth it Verse 16, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. Then sheep will graze as in their own pasture. Lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. So in the wake of the Lord's judgment, God will be exalted and proved holy. And all that will, all that will remain, and again, speaking specifically here of Israel, all that will be, remain after the Lord's justice has fallen are the ruins of what these rich and powerful and the not-so-rich and powerful had will lie in ruins because they had abandoned their God. And, of course, this is exactly what we see in Judah and Jerusalem after Nebuchadnezzar finally comes in and ultimately sacks Jerusalem and raises the temple. You see a place where all that remain are the sheep and the lambs grazing among the detritus of what had once been a great city. Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes, to those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach, let it come into view so we may know it. And I think what we're seeing here, what, what this woe is pronounced against those that we might call the self-righteous, those who have 
secret sin, hidden sin in their lives, and are presenting themselves as the pillars of the church, but who in private are as base as the worst sinner. The problem is, if you've got secret sin in your life and you're hiding it from your fellow believers, God already knows it's there. Can you hide anything from God? Now, I, love, I know it's probably happened to you. I'm sure it has. It's happened to me. You walk into a room where people know you, and as you're approaching the door, you hear them laughing, and you hear them telling what you might call off-color stories and using what some would call coarse language. And you walk into the room, and someone from the group looks up and sees you. And they go, shh, the preacher might hear. And they say it soft enough so that the preacher isn't supposed to hear that. And of course, they all stop what they're doing and pretend that they're back in church on Sunday morning. And it's always struck me that how ironic it is that they appear to be more concerned with offending the preacher than they are with offending God. Because God already knows what they've been saying and thinking. And I believe that's who God is talking about here. Those who try to hide something from the preacher, those who try to hide something from God or from a fellow church member. And yet, in their appearance of this false righteousness, they're the ones that are saying, Yes, I can hardly wait for God's judgment to fall on the unrighteous when what they fail to realize is that they're asking for God's judgment to fall on themselves. What's that famous line, we have met the enemy and he is us? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions of mixing drinks. And I don't think God's talking about bartenders there. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. These last three woes in chapter 5 come in rapid succession. God is pronouncing woe on those who are seeking to turn the culture and the social order upside down. Do we see any of those today? Those who boast in themselves and believe themselves to be cleverer than they are. I think Paul in Romans talks about people professing themselves to become wise, but they became fools. Those who are seeking worldly pleasure above seeking that which is pleasing to God those who are willing to, sub to subvert justice for a bribe, those who would let the guilty go free and who couldn't care less about the innocent. And how much of that are we seeing here in our country today? Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in flames, so their roots will decay, decay and their flowers blow up, sorry, and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. The result of the Lord removing his hand of providence and protection from his people. Remember that writ of divorcement in the middle of chapter 1. After the Lord tells Israel that he finds their offerings and sacrifices, that they're meaningless. That their Sabbath observances, their feasts and their festivals, their new moon festivals. He finds them offensive. They are a burden. He's grown weary of them. And then he concludes that 
section in chapter 1 with that last line when he says, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. The Lord is telling the children of Israel that even as he sees the devastations being brought against them because of these judgments, that for all of this, his anger will not be turned away. His hand will not be lowered to stop it. Verse 26, he lifts up a banner for the distant nations, essentially calling those nations to war against Israel. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumbers or sleeps. Not a belt is loosened at the waist, nor a sandal strap broken. Their arrows are sharp. All their bows are strung. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their chariot wheels like a whirlwind. Their roar is like that of a lion. They roar like young lions. They growl as they seize their prey and carry it off with no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, there will only be darkness and distress. And even the sun will be darkened by clouds. The judgment the Lord will bring against the children of Israel what is happening or has happened in the northern kingdom, what will be happening in the southern kingdom in a few generations when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and destroys the city, raises the temple, and carries the children back to Babylon. These are the result of the Lord's lifting of his hand of providence and protection from Israel. In other words, God is no longer holding back these nations surrounding Israel that have desired Israel all these years. The lesson for us today, I think, is simply this. While we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, if we have no use for God in our lives, God will have no use for us in the work of building his kingdom. serve God. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, next week, we're finally moving out of this opening prophecy, and we'll get into chapter 6, which is actually where Isaiah receives his call and commission as a prophet. Thank you.